there's an amazing chapter in the Gospels. It's Luke chapter 7. And there we have three stories of faith, the soldier, the sage, and the sinner. There, there's just such rich, you know, truth to be mined out of these three stories. Each one is, is you know, completely different and yet, yet rich with, with truth that can help our lives. So let's look at these three stories of faith, the soldier, the sage, and the sinner. Well, if you have a Bible with you, please open to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I want to talk to you from this chapter about three different stories of faith. The first one dealing with a soldier, the second with a sage, and the third with a sinner. All from Luke chapter 7. The soldier, the sage, and the sinner. And we're going to probably take about three lessons from each one of them that are applicable to our life. So are you ready? Yeah. Now I told you what I'm going to tell you. I will tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you <laughs> before we're done. Father, we ask you for understanding from your spirit today. Open our eyes that they might see. Cause our hearts to comprehend and to grasp the truth of your word. Because Father, we truly, we truly want to put it into practice and we give you our undivided attention in Jesus' name. All right, three stories of faith. The first one dealing with a soldier. And before we're done, we will have read a lot of this chapter today. Verse 1, Luke 7. Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation. He's built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes. And my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. It's interesting that Jesus actually marveled at this man's faith. He said he had great faith greater than anyone he'd met in the whole nation of Israel. Only two things in the scripture Jesus ever marveled at. One was faith and the other was unbelief. If he's going to marvel at me, I don't want him marveling at my unbelief. Now, I want to just share with you three things that I believe were important components in this Gentile and this Roman centurion having what Jesus referred to as great faith. The first was his humility. He was humble. Humility is essential in receiving from God. The scripture declares God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And friend, everything you need in whatever situation you might be in is contained within the scope of grace today. God gives grace to the humble. You know, in verse 4, the Jewish elders, when they came to Jesus, said, look, he's deserving or he is worthy, the one for whom you should do this. And then they said, why? He built the synagogue. He loves our nation. But when Jesus gets there, the guy says of himself twice, I'm not worthy. He said, I, I, I didn't consider myself worthy to come to you even. That's why I sent the Jews. And now I don't consider myself worthy for you to even come under my roof. He didn't even think, think himself worthy of a visit while the Jews thought him worthy of the cure. Proverbs 27 and 2 says, Let another man praise you and not your own mouth. Anytime we come to God trying to obtain things from him based on our good works, no matter how noble or numerous those works might be, we will always be turned away empty. Man, it's great that you have, you know, a Cal Ripken, you know, record when it comes to church attendance. That's awesome. You never miss church. Amen. You know, carry on. 
You know, it's, it's great that you lead the family in devotions. It's great that you give generously and you maybe even give sacrificially to, to, you know, our H4 offering. But those things don't merit you blessings from God. Jesus has already paid it all. And we, we can't come to him based on our works. It's by, by grace through faith that we obtain things from God. I think the emptiest people in the world are those that are full of themselves. Second thing that stands out to me about this, this man was that he required only the word. He asked for no other evidence. He looked for no other evidence. He said, Jesus, just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, he only said that once he knew that Jesus was willing, not when he just knew that Jesus was able. Now, I just want to humbly humbly submit something to you today. I know you know God is able. You ask any rank and file sinner on the street, can God do anything? And they'll say yes. I mean, obviously, he's not God if he can't. If he's God, he can do anything. It doesn't take much faith to say God is able. But I want to ask you, do you believe he wants to help you? With your present distress, your present economic situation, your marriage situation. Maybe you just got jilted by a boyfriend or a girlfriend and your heart is breaking. With a situation with your kids, whatever you're grappling with, do you believe God's not only able, but he wants to help you? Until you believe that, there's no basis for faith. He's able and he's willing. The Bible says we have known and believed the love that God has for us. And I want to tell you, in case you haven't worked it out, he is willing. Jesus walked a full day's journey out of his way to show his willingness. In fact, he did more than that. He came down from heaven to earth to show his willingness. He wants to help you. Third thing that stands out to me, the third component, if you would, regarding this man and his great faith was the fact that he was under authority. He was illustrating that in the same way that soldiers submitted themselves to him because he was under authority himself, I say to one, go, and he goes, come, and he comes, do this, and he does it. Jesus, I know that you're under authority to God, and because of that, your authority over sickness will work. You can command sickness to leave, and it will obey your authority because you have submitted yourself to fa the Father the same way I've submitted myself to my commander, therefore my authority works. And though the centurion was just making an illustration, I believe that part of the equation, like his humility that enabled him to have what Jesus called great faith, was his submitted heart or his willingness to be under authority. Now, there's going to be maybe one, two people in here right now that this applies to, so the rest of you can just sit tight. You see, the, the seeds of faith have a difficult time growing in a rebellious heart. Even if a genuine faith does manage to take root, the poison vines of rebellion choke out most of faith's fruit before they come to maturity. And we find the principle throughout Scripture. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. If you don't first submit your life to God, your authority over the devil doesn't work. When it comes to children, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right that it will be well with you and you'll live a long time on the earth. See, this doesn't happen if this doesn't happen, if there's not a submitted heart in the child. When it comes to marriage, the Bible talks about, you know, wives submitting to their husbands, but it also says submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Submission is a big issue. When it comes to, to the workplace, I mean, it, and it's, it's, it's far more graphic, if you would, in the Scriptures because it, it uses the scenario of a master and a, a slave, an indentured servant. And it says, Christian servants, you need to, to, to work for your master and serve him, not just with eye service when he's looking as a man pleaser, but, but with your full heart as if Jesus were your master, even if the person you're working for is unjust. Talks about being submitted to authority and leadership in church. And the thing is, there's some people that just have this issue with authority, no matter where it is. 
They're always bucking against authority. They're always trying to undermine authority at work. They don't like something the boss or they come to, ooh, and they're sowing seeds of discord, getting people by the water cooler. Oh, I don't like where they did this and they did that, and they're, they're sowing seeds of division in the workplace. Comes to church, well, I don't like what the pastor said or this person, you know, said they don't want us to do that. And I, don't, no, 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 I don't like this and I don't like that, and they're sowing seeds of discord. They're sowing seeds of rebellion, and they can't understand why their faith doesn't work. Now, for the one or two people that applied to, I just want you to take it to heart. <laughs> All right, let's move on. The next person in our, our little journey today is the sage. First the soldier, then the sage, John the Baptist. He's a prophet. He's an oracle of God. And unlike this centurion, this, this Gentile that has great faith in God, John the, the, the sage is having a crisis of faith. Verse 18, look there with me if you would. And in the meantime, the uh, young man has been raised from the dead at the city of Nain, but we, we pick it up in verse 18. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now John at this time is in Herod's prison cell. But prior to this, he was there at the Jordan River when the heavens opened and he personally heard God's voice when Jesus was baptized. John has previously been spoken to by God about Jesus. God said to John, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John has publicly testified that Jesus is the Son of God. John has already said, I must decrease while he increases. He has directed others to follow him, but now in the darkness of that prison cell, he begins to doubt and he begins to question. Unlike the... the, the the, the centurion, the Gentile, who had none of John's experience, who had none of John's knowledge, who said, all the evidence I need, Jesus, is your word. Here's John, the sage, the prophet, the flesh and blood cousin of Jesus, mind you, the one visited by God, spoken to by God, no doubt all of his long life, you know, has heard from his mother Elizabeth about Jesus. Hey, John, were you, when you were in my belly, when Mary came in with Jesus and she was pregnant, then you started jumping around. You knew even before you were born he was the Son of God. And here John is in essence saying, I need more. Can I have a sign? Verse 21. That very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you've seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who is not offended or who doesn't stumble because of me. In other words, tell John it's the same evidence that's been there all along. I'm just doing the same things I've done all along. Nothing's changed. He's not going to get any other evidence. Now, there's three things I want to share with you from this story. Number one, John went to the right place with his doubts and his fears. He went straight to the Lord. And if you're grappling with any kind of doubt, you need to talk to the Lord about it because he knows it anyway. There's no secrets from him. King David said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. The worst thing that could happen to any of us if we're having any kind of a crisis of faith is for us to get isolated. That's when we are most vulnerable. That's just what the devil wants to isolate us. We need to, to draw close to friends of faith that can encourage us and draw close to God if there's some sort of a crisis. And, and frankly, sometimes things happen in life to just seem, you know, to kick the legs out of your little stool temporarily. And you don't want to go from God, you want to go to God. And John did the right thing. He, 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 he shouldn't have been in a crisis of faith, he shouldn't have been doubting, but he was. And he went straight to Jesus. 
And you know what? He didn't let his pride keep him from going there. He could have thought, man, I'm going to look like an idiot. I've already told everybody he's the Son of God. I've directed my own disciples to follow him, and now everybody's going to know I'm doubting and that maybe I'm unsure. This is going to make me look really stupid. I can't do this. Now, he, he overrode his own pride, and he went to Jesus. You know, our foolishness gets us, us in trouble, and our pride keeps us there. But John teaches us a lesson. He didn't let his pride keep him there. And the second thing, and this is important, to people, a single event may define us. It might be a, a fiery speech, a single heroic or sacrificial act, or even a single negative or bad thing that we've done may fix us and define us in people's minds, but not with the Lord. With Him, it's the whole journey that defines us, not a single event, good or bad. Look in verse 24 with me. It says, When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitude concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled live in luxury or in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, John's messengers have gone back to report to him there in the prison cell. Crowd gathers around Jesus. He starts to talk to him about John. Let me tell you what he doesn't say. You want to know about John? Let me tell you about John. What an utter disappointment. I can't believe he has faltered at the end of his race. He did so well, and, and now he, he stumbles. I'm just, I am utterly disappointed in him. I mean, my good, he is my cousin, for goodness sake. If anyone should have understood my ministry, it would have been him. God has spoken to him. God has visited him. I can't believe it. I mean, I'm, I'm done with John. I'm going to get me a new forerunner. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus said he was no reed shaken in the wind. No, no John was a man of conviction. He, he was a man that lived a sacrificial life. He called him a prophet. He was a forerunner. He said that he was great. You see, this single failing while in prison did not define John. And here's my point. Don't get stuck. Not on a single achievement or on a single failure. The race is for a lifetime, and you've still got some laps to run. Now, some, maybe somebody, maybe you did some foolish thing, some immoral thing. And there are certain people that in their minds you are fixed. That's who you are. They've got you pegged. All right, let them think it. They have to live with their thoughts, not you. You've got some more chapters in your story to write, friend, and it's your whole story that defines you, not one thing that you did, good or bad. The third point is this with John. There is diversity in ministry. Verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by all her children. Now, John should have been admired for being such a humble, sober, self-denying man, a man of solitude and boldness. But that which should have been for his praise was turned to his reproach. They said, hey, he doesn't come eating and drinking and, 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 you know, cheerfully associating with us. You know, he lives in the wilderness. He's a savage. He's talking about chopping down trees and he's calling people snakes. Tell you that John's got a demon. He's just like the, the demoniac by the tombs. Maybe not as fierce, but I tell you that, that John's, he's demon-possessed. Jesus, on the other hand, comes eating and drinking. He dined with publicans and with Pharisees. He conversed freely with them. He tried to do them good and turn them to God. But the same people said, Oh, Jesus, he eats too much, and he drinks too much wine. You should see the crowd he runs with. I'll tell you, his morals are corrupted. Same people criticized him both. He just couldn't win. There's a few lessons there, but here's an important one. Ministers of Christ can have very different dispositions and personalities 
as well as styles of preaching and living, yet all can be good and useful. We cannot make one person the standard and judge everyone else that doesn't do as they do or sound like they sound. God is a God of diversity. Verse 35, it says, wisdom is justified by all of her children. In other words, the children, the people that come to God will praise him for the avenue that his wisdom took in bringing them to a place of holy submission to him. All right, let's move on to our third person in the saga, the sinner. Verse 36, the same chapter, says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him for she's a sinner. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Jesus said to him, you've rightly judged. Verse 47, therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And this woman is obviously quite notorious for her sins. Simon said to himself, oh, if this man, if he knew who she was and what she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. And really, there's pretty few things that a woman could be notorious for in that day. Chances are this woman was a prostitute. But oh, what lessons she teaches us. The first one is that faith is expressed through action. She believed, she'd heard about Jesus, she believed that he had what her life needed, and so she came. And it amazes me that she got into Simon's house. Pretty ingenious woman. And she gets there, and as they were in Eastern custom, they would sit on cushions with their feet behind him. She comes behind Jesus, kneels down weeping, begins to wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. She believes that despite her past, if she comes, Jesus will not turn her away. It's a good thing she didn't try and wash Simon's feet. <laughs> Would have been a very different narrative if she had tried. But she came. Some of you, you need to come. You need to act. He won't turn you away. Some of you feel like if you came to God, he'd turn you away. I'm telling you, he will not turn you away. I don't care what you've done or what you've failed to do. He loves you. Faith is expressed through action. Come to him. Second story, or the second lesson we learn from this woman is the greater the sinner, the greater the saint. Jesus told the little parable. Simon said, look, this one guy, 500 denarii, another guy, 50. They both owe. One equals a year and a half's wages. The other is a month and a half wage. Neither one had the wherewithal to pay. He said, the guy that, that they owed it to forgave them both. Which one's going to love more? And he said, well, the one that was forgiven more. Jesus says, right. That's exactly right. Forgiven much, love much. You know, when a persecuting Saul became a preaching Paul, the Scripture says he labored more abundantly. And there are some of us here that have an extreme sense of the unpayable debt we owed that was paid for by the one that owed nothing. And then thirdly and finally, faith alone can save you and give you peace with God. In verse 50, Jesus said this, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It agrees with the book of Ephesians. By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. Listen, self-denial, generous, extravagant, even sacrificial giving to the cause of Christ will not buy you peace with God. It won't bring you peace. It's by faith alone. Faith reaches out and receives what the hand of God's grace is freely offering. Forgiveness, peace, salvation, restoration, a fresh start. You can't earn it. You just have to receive it. I hope you got something out of the message because I sure enjoyed preaching and teaching it. There's two things I'd like to do right now. Number one, I want to thank those of you that support the broadcast. You know, the scripture teaches that, that it's a right thing to do when spiritual things are sown to you, that you, in, in return, you sow material things. And there are people that do faithfully support us and there are others I trust God will lay it on your heart to do it. But I want to say a big thank you to those of you that have been faithful to do it. Secondly, if you're watching me and you've never opened your heart to Jesus, I'm not asking you for anything except that you open your heart and say yes to Jesus Christ. You could be doing anything right now. You could be anywhere right now. Why are you listening to me? There has to be a reason for that. There has to be a deep spiritual hunger in your heart. I suspect you've been looking for God for quite a while. Well, take this as, as God's touch on your life saying, hey, I've seen your heart and here I am. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Call on him and you won't be disappointed. See you next time.